Thank you. Right. OK, good evening and welcome everyone uh, to our virtual meeting of Planning Committee A. My name's Danny Kendall. I'll be chairing this evening's meeting in accordance with the rules and procedures that have been set out. Um, before we move on, if I could just run through very quickly a bit of housekeeping to make sure that we're all up to speed on that. Hold on, let me alter. Apologies, I'll just click to the chat so I can see what's going on there. Right, so housekeeping. Um, you'll been, you will have been provided with the council's etiquette for the virtual meetings in advance of this, but uh, just to reiterate a few key points, um, please do make sure your device is fully charged or is charging uh, so it doesn't just switch off at some point during the meeting. Uh, please mute, very importantly, please mute microphones when you're not speaking. When invited to address the committee, please ensure your microphone is switched on. Um, when you have finished addressing the committee, please turn the microphone off immediately. Um, please ensure that you've switched off any other devices, which I will also make sure of now. So make sure all mobile phones are on silent so they're not going to interrupt anything. Um, if any member of the uh, committee encounters IT problems causing you to drop out of the meeting at any point, please make your best efforts to rejoin the meeting as quickly as possible. Uh, should the member not be able to rejoin you will be deemed to have left the meeting at that point um, and the committee will proceed um, as normal as long as it remains quiet. Uh, committee members um, we need to just very quickly run through do a quick roll call of you to make sure that you're all here and that you're all able to see and hear the proceedings could I ask Olivia Quinn from Democratic Services just do a very quick roll call for me please Thanks, Chairman. So, we'll start off with you, Councillor Kendall. I confirm that I can hear and see proceedings. Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards, I can confirm I can see and hear all proceedings. Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam, I can confirm I can see and hear all the proceedings. Councillor Dixon. Councillor Dixon present, can see and hear. I have to say that Councillor Adam came through on a very poor vocal. Um, we'll try and sort that during the meeting. Councillor Eden. Councillor Eden, I can see and hear all proceedings. Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings, I can see and hear all proceedings. And Councillor Parry. Good evening, everybody. Councillor Parry, I can see and hear everything. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Olivia. Excellent. So um, we've we've gone through this before, of course, but if a councillor does wish to speak on an item, please could you indicate this through the chat function on the right hand side of the screen? Uh, if you just say something along the lines of can I speak, please? And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll notice that very quickly and I'll bring you in at the right moment. Right, officers, uh, could I ask you to introduce yourselves as well? Uh, Olivia, could we start with you, please? Olivia Quinn, Democratic Services. Thank you. Uh, Mina? Mina Mack, Legal Services. Thank you. Tracy? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'm Tracy Humphreys and I'm your planning manager for tonight's meeting. Thank you, Tracy. And then we have our uh, Officers, so we have Erin. Erin Weatherstone, Planning Officer. Thank you. Alice. Alice Cosnett, Planning Officer. Thank you. And Tony. Tony Horton, Senior Planner. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. I think we've got everyone, which is fantastic. So um, just to remind people that obviously this meeting is being webcast uh, and should you uh, want to look at it back again the next day or two, you can. Um, Please be aware, of course, that it's being broadcast and the images and sound recordings uh, may be used for training purposes at a future date. Public speakers, a quick note to you guys as well. Um, you'll be given, obviously, a, a set amount of time in the uh, different for each, pe each person. I'll go over that at the right moment. Uh, you'll also be given a 30 second warning before the end of your speaking allocation. Could I ask you, though, to make sure that you don't immediately leave the meeting when you've finished speaking. Please stay on the line just in case there are any questions from the committee. 
Um, moving to voting, when we do come to vote on any of the applications tonight, uh, if I can remind members of the committee that they should respond with the, your name um, and then a clear for, against or abstain. Right, those uh, are the pieces of housekeeping we've got for the virtual meeting. We move to agenda item one. Apologies for absence. Chair, we've got no apologies. Thank you, Olivia. Um, item agenda two, disclosure of interests. I'll kick this one off if that's OK. I received a number of emails regard, um, regarding the first application tonight, which is item four, application reference 19 slash 02923 slash FUL. And I will declare that on behalf of the entire committee because I believe everybody was copied in on that. So that's a, that disclosure of interest. Are there any other disclosure of interests, please? Councillor no. Dixon, uh, I'm going to say not 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 a, uh, a not a pecuniary interest, but I am supporting my residents on the third item tonight, uh, the uh, uh, application for the reinstatement of PD rights on Highland. So, Councillor Dixon, I understand that you'll step down from the committee for that, but you are registered to speak as the ward member. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. Oh, Chair, you're muted. Sorry about that. Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> Can I confirm uh, that we are all content with the minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of June? I'll accept a nodding of heads from the committee, and if that's OK, if not, speak up now. That's wonderful. I will sign those in due course. In which case, we can move to our first application of the evening. This is item four, found on page five of your agendas. And um, this is application reference 19 slash 02923 slash FUL and is for Churchland's Caravan Site, Churchland's Business Park, Ufton Road, Harbury. That's, the description is for the change of use of land to a caravan and camping site for 51 pitches for touring units. In, uh, it also involves a revised layout, retention of a static caravan for residential occupation, provision of lighting, drainage, landscaping and a public footway. The presenting officer for this application is Erin Weatherstone. Erin, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Please may I confirm that everyone can see the presentation on the screen. Perfect. The application site lies to the northeast of Harbury Village, as identified by the black dot on this plan, just here. Harbury is identified as a Category 1 local service village within the Council's adopted core strategy. The site lies outside of the settlement boundary identified within the adopted neighbourhood plan in the countryside. The site lies directly north of the railway line and east of public right of way SM24. I'm sorry, I can't see anything other than the three items to start off with. Yeah, Aaron, the, the, the presentation's not rolling through. I don't know if you could just read. Do you want to reshare your screen? What I'll do is I'll reshare it. Sorry about that and see Sorry. if it works the second time. Thank you. Can Chair. everyone see the presentation now? Not yet, no. I've got it now. Yes. Do you want to just flip forward a slide or two to make sure it's working? Yeah, working perfectly. Okay. Brilliant. I'll, I'll start yeah, from the beginning then. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So the application site lies to the northeast of Harbury Village, as identified by the black dot on the plan just here. Harbury is identified as a Category 1 local service village within the Council's adopted core strategy. The site lies outside of the settlement boundary, identified within the adopted neighbourhood plan in the countryside. The site lies directly north of the railway line and east of public right of way SM24. This slide identifies the application site outlined in red, just here. The site comprises of a parcel of agricultural land located to the north of Churchland's business park, just here. Access to the site is shared with other businesses and connects to the Ufton Road to the west, just here. Public right of way SM24 is visible to the west of the site as identified by the green dashed line on the plan, just shown here on the plan. The railway line and the edge of Harvey settlement are visible to the south of the site. You've got the railway line here 
the Harby settlement just here. Planning permission is sought for the material change of use of the land to a camping and caravan site for 51 pitches for touring units, including touring caravans, motorhomes, trailer tents and tents. The development also includes a retention of a mobile home for residential occupation and associated works, including lighting, drainage, landscaping and a new public footway, which will connect the site to Harby Village along the Ufton Road in this section here. The works are part retrospective insofar as a mobile home is currently sited on the land and the site is being used as a touring caravan site with an informal layout. This slide shows an aerial image of the area. The site is visible to the north of the existing bu buildings just here. The settlement of Harbury and the railway line are visible to the south. You see Harbury here and the railway line just here to the south. Since this image was taken, additional works have been carried out to the west and east of the site. To the west, a new access has been installed approximately here and new hard standing is in this location here and engineering works have been carried out to the east of the site. At the time of the site visit last Friday, works were also being carried out to the railway embankment to the south in this area, approximately here. This slide shows a proposed site layout. The development seeks to retain the existing vehicular access from Churchland's business park and existing field access points to the north here and southeast of the site, with the main access for the caravans coming in here. Graveled access road is proposed to serve the 26 hard standing pitches to the south of the site, this area here. To the north of the site, 25 grass pitches are proposed with reinforced grass tracks here, here and here on the plan. The existing mobile home on the site is proposed to be retained in its current location to the southeast of the site, the mobile home just here. Service points and facilities proposed for customers within the site and include shower and toilet facilities, water, power and bin storage. New trees and hedgerow planting is proposed as part of the development and the hedge along the northern boundary of the site is proposed to be restocked along its full length where the site adjoins the countryside. So this hedgerow here. This slide shows a proposed footway which will connect the development to Harbury Village. Just on this side here. The proposed footway would measure approximately 120 metres in length and would vary in width between 1.2 and 1.5 metres. The footway seeks to introduce a new drop curb which will connect to the existing footway which leads into Harbury Village. So we've got the connection point just here and here. The proposal also seeks to replace the existing bus stop. The photographs to the right of the slide show the eastern edge of the Ufton Road where the footway is proposed to be installed. So just here and here on the photographs. This slide shows a photograph taken from a road to the north, looking back towards the application site. The approximate location of the site is indicated by the red arrow, approximately here. This slide shows a photograph taken from the Ufton Road, looking towards the site. Again, the, width, the red arrow indicates the approximate location of the site. This slide shows a vehicular access to the site from the Ufton Road. Moving from the left image over here, the site Access travels from the Ufton Road, past existing businesses, which are shown in photograph two here, down a track in photograph three, then across the parcel of land where the caravans are located, just at the rear of photograph four, just here. This photograph was taken looking eastwards across the site from the entrance to the touring caravan area, just looking across the site. This photograph was taken looking in a southwestern direction from within the site. The mobile home is visible to the right of the image, just here. And to the rear, you can see the buildings associated with Churchland's Business Park. This photograph was taken from the edge of the site looking in a southwestern direction. This slide shows a photograph which was taken looking in a western direction across the site. The existing planting along the northern boundary is visible to the right of the image, just here. And the final slide shows a photograph which was taken looking in a southeastern direction across the site. This photograph was taken close to the field access to the north of the site, looking back across the application site. There are a number of updates for this application which have been circulated on the update sheet. It is recommended that planning permission be refused for the reasons set out in the officer report. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Brilliant stuff. Um, 
before we go to our first speaker, just a quick word on the update sheet, just so everybody, members of the public as well know, it is quite a long update sheet. It was circulated earlier on today and all members of the planning committee have been given about 15, 20 minutes to read and digest that before the meeting started, just so everyone's clear on that point as well. Right, in that case, we go to our first speaker. This is Councillor, Councillor Samantha Allen from Harbury Parish Council. Councillor Allen, are you there? Hello. Hello, Councillor Allen. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Uh, and I'm getting nods from the rest of the committee. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you for joining us tonight. Okay. Um, you've got three minutes to address the committee. At the end of that three minutes, would you please uh, stay on the line just in case there are any questions from the committee? Um, and I'll give you a 30 second warning before the end of your time, if that's OK. Yes, lovely. Lovely. Well, whenever you're ready, please, please begin. Um, yes, so I'm from Harbury Parish Council. Um, we supported this application, um, especially because of the installation of the new public footpath that they were proposing to install, um, which was a, a significant change from the, the previous application. Um, the benefit will be for the, for the trading estate and the caravan park that's already located here. The officer's report refers to some non-compliance of policies H01 and H04 from our neighbourhood development plan. And we consider that this has been misinterpreted and these policies have been written for provision of permanent residential dwellings and as such we would consider this application for touring units not to be impacted by these policies. In regard to policy AS10 from the local plan we believe there is a demonstrable need shown as this is a par partially retrospective application. There are ongoing works at the Harbour Cutting by network rail which this site is adjacent to and this pr has provided increased economic benefits over many years to Harbury Village and we consider this aligns with paragraphs 83 and 84 of the NPPF, NPPF which seek to support a prosperous rural, rural economy. We also consider the local plan policy CS24 is fully justified. The just under one hectare site is directly associated with the long-term business use site, Network Rail, since 2016. And the case officer's report indicates that the site should conform to a major existing tourist or recreation facility in addition to this. However, the written policy clearly indicates that it is not necessary to comply with all of these. The conclusion in the report also refers to CS15 from the local plan regarding dispersal development. Once more, this has been misinterpreted and taken out of context, as again, the policy is written for permanent residential dwellings and no weight should be afforded to this. Harbury Parish Council will therefore consider that this application is sufficiently supported by these policies and we will reconfirm our support for this application at this committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, you have plenty of time left as well. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee for the Parish Council, please, if you'd like to indicate in the chat, please? Just give that two seconds. OK. OK, in that case, thank you, Peter. Uh, Councillor Richards, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Richards speaking. Um, thank you very much for your um, your presentation there. Um, you, you mentioned your policies H01 and H04 and that they've been misinterpreted. I wonder if you can expand a little bit on that for me and also um, let me know if there's anything within your NDP that uh, policy wise that does in fact support this application. Any specific policy? Um, the, 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 only, um, the only thing in our NDP that um, is it's possibly open to interpretation is, is where we've um, designated our built up area boundary. But because this is a, a commercial site, not a residential site, it shouldn't really apply because, the, you know, the development policies have been written for residential development. Um, HO1 and, and HO4 have been written for, for housing, for permanent housing, but, the, but this, is, this is for touring. Um, and, and we consider that economically it's a benefit to our village, even in the position that it is outside the, the area boundary. That's, That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Uh, if I'm not picking up any further questions from the committee, so in, in which case, uh, Councillor Allen, thank you very much for your time tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
OK, we can go to our next speaker. I hope we've got um, Patrick Atherton, please, agent for the applicant. Mr Atherton, are you there? Mr Atherton? He's on, Jay. I think you need to press star six to unmute. Star six to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr Atherton, thank you. Hello. Thank you for waiting. Could I just say something? Uh, yes. I haven't, used, I haven't used Teams before like this, and I'm finding that the um, what I can hear on my telephone is not uh, in sync with what I can see. And what I can see is several uh, uh, seconds, probably a minute behind uh, what I'm hearing on my telephone. So I can't follow exactly what is being said because it's very confusing. Um, well, I, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Aston. I think given the circumstances, what we're, at the, we're at the mercy of technology and internet connections at the moment, uh, it's, we'll take the point on board and we'll continue to work with our IT specialists to make, you know, make that as we go along. At, for example, at the moment, you're looking straight at me, but you're not talking. Well, don't worry, I can hear everything you're saying, um, so I think the meeting can proceed. Um, if you're happy to uh, continue. It's, 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 it's obviously OK from your point of view, but not from mine, um, be, because the, the, what I'm hearing on the phone isn't in sync with what is happening actually in the committee, um, which is very confusing. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Atherton. Uh, we, uh, uh, to be honest with you, at this point, we're at an impasse. I, I, if you don't want to speak, you don't have to. It's up to you, I think, really. No, I, don't, I, I do want to speak, but I'm just letting you know that it, um, it, it's not satisfactory from my point of view. Um, I, I know I know it may be from yours, but not from mine. Uh, I understand. Um, that. I've taken it on board. We, we'll continue to work with uh, IT to see if we can we can uh, make that better in future, in future meetings. Uh, leave it with us for now. Um, okay. I presume you heard the the uh, rules for the other speaker. You have three minutes. If you please don't uh, leave the line after the three minutes is up, we may have some questions for you. And I'll give you a warning at the last thirty seconds. Um, Mr. Atherton, over to you. The recommendation to refuse relies on the following: the proposal is not small scale tourism development in policy AS 10S. The proposal is large scale development for 80 plus units in the table of Part K3 camping and caravan sites. Policy CS24 requires large scale overnight accommodation development to be located in Stratford on Avon or a main rural centre. The pro proposal will cause harm defined as a principle. My rebuttal is policy AS10S is a presumption in favour of small scale tourism and visitor accommodation development in the countryside, but not to the exclusion of anything else. However, Tourism and leisure related schemes will also be assessed against the provisions of policy CS24. Part K3 applies to policy CS24. Part K3 table defines proposal for 51 touring units as medium scale. Large scale applies to 80 plus units. The table is unlawful because it does not comply with DOE Circular 2083 model standards for touring caravans. Planning permission was granted in 2017 for 20 static caravans at Harbury Fields Farm increasing 58 units to 78. That is a medium scale development. Policy CS24 states large scale schemes for visitor attractions or overnight accommodation should, wherever possible, be located within the urban areas of Stratford-upon-Avon or a main rural centre. It is not possible to locate the caravan site in these urban areas. Policy CS24 provides an exception for large scale proposals for new tourism development to be located in the countryside subject to seven criteria with which the proposal complies. The harm alleged is the benefits of the scheme are not considered to outweigh the harm identified with the principle of locating large scale visitor accommodation in open countryside in close proximity to a local service village rather than Stratford on Avon town or a main rural centre. The proposal is not large scale. The report identifies many benefits, but does not identify any harm that would be caused to the countryside. The planning principle is not evidence of harm. Even if the proposal was large scale, it would be considered under the relevant policy to which I just referred, policy CS24. 
farm diversification. The Carolina campsite is farm diversification contributing to the farm business. In agricultural use, the land would contribute £350 per annum compared with 15231 last year. 30 seconds, Chair. Thank you. 30 seconds. Since his father's death, Adam is running the farming business on the caravan site. Adam is an essential agricultural rural worker. The only accommodation available to him and his family is their mobile home. His mother still lives in the farmhouse. The land can continue to be used with permissive development rights. These are part four, class B, 28 days camping, and part five, class A, use as a caravan site. Paragraph nine allows land to be used to provide accommodation for persons employed in building and engineering operations being undertaken on adjoining land. I brought this to the council's attention Hi. on 27th Hi. February. PD Hi. rights would not secure the new public footway and site improvements, including landscaping. The planning application- Ms. Patterson, I'm going to have to put you off there, I'm afraid. Sorry, your time has elapsed, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're over three minutes. I'm, I'm apologies. I have to stop you there. Um, I think we've got a, a very good idea of what your what your points were and, and the case you were making. Could I ask uh, uh, the members of the committee, do they have any questions they would like to ask uh, Mr Atherton, the age of the applicant? If you could indicate in the chat, please. I'm not seeing anything come up here. Oh, yes, Pete, uh, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Richards here. Um, thank you to uh, the agent there for his um, his little um, speech. Um, I just wanted to get clarity on your um, on, on what you've said specifically around policy CS24. It sounds like you were saying that you don't think CS24 has been interpreted correctly. Is that right? Or are you saying it hasn't been considered at all? No, it's not been interpreted correctly. The, the policy allows exceptions. Um, subject to compliance with seven criteria. This application complies with those seven criteria. In addition to that, I'm saying that um, the, the uh, development isn't large scale. Um, it's uh, medium scale, according to the, the numbers of, of pitches. Um, uh, there's, there's actually no provision in the local plan that relates to medium scale whatsoever. There's just small scale and uh, large scale. Um, the no consideration has been given to okay. that point. I think, OK, understood. Uh, thank you for that. I, I think um, the, it's a it's a question over interpretation rather than anything else. I just wanted that clarity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions for our speaker. Which I think there aren't. Mr Afton, thank you very much for your time this evening. It's appreciated. Right, we'll move on. Um, in which case we move to um, uh, our next speaker, uh, the ward member, I should say, Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris, are you there? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? It's Councillor Harris. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, you know the routine. Uh, you have a, you have five minutes to speak, and obviously stay on the, on the, in the meeting at the end of that time, so we can ask you questions. Councillor Harris, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the Parish Council and Mr Atherton have covered the points succinctly regarding policy. I will also ask the um, committee just to bear in mind the current climate we're in around business and jobs and creating jobs. I think it's been a difficult three or four months and business has hit hard and this would help the local economy and the area substantially. I would like to say I spoke to Mr Leon Richardson who's been a site manager with Murphy's for quite some years. He spent um, about six years in Harbury managing the emergency embankment and engineering works and other ongoing works. And obviously we've got HS2 in the area as well. And he's telling me that he's had many dealings with the For uh, Moore family due to the source location of affordable accommodation for the many employees during the major railway projects. Um, it was affordable accommodation, which is not usually available elsewhere in the area, especially around Harbury and its local area. Murphy's have a lot of work ongoing and new contracts commencing in the future. They do need accommodation, as I would have thought HS2 do, and they'll need this going forward for quite a few years, I understand, probably 10 to 15. Um, due to the seriousness of making sure the trains could travel as well as normal with no danger to life, the works have been undertaken quickly. 
Um, they would not have completed these works in the required time scale if he had not had the accommodation at Churchland's Farm caravan site, which is minimised travelling time, which obviously supports our um, plan with reducing emissions and saving the planet. Um, the location of the site is saying ideal for them, uh, Murphy's employees, but it's also environmentally sustainable. He apparently speaks for himself and other Murphy's employees that the caravan site hadn't existed. We would have been, would not have been able to carry out the work as efficiently and safely as they have. As a family business, Murphy's have a real good relationship with local residents in the village and have carried out numerous works for the community. Their employees support local businesses and the local economy. Churchland's caravan farm uh, site is essential for all, including other contractors who are involved in the works around the area. The current application proposal to upgrade the layout of the facilities and services would be very welcome and strongly supported by other local businesses. From this gentleman's knowledge, people from the village have been injured by vehicles when walking on Ufton Road between Harbury and the public footpath at Churchland's Business Park. The absence of a footway on Ufton Road is a major risk, especially at night time. So provision of a new footway link with the public footpath is a must. This is what we're really pushing for. Um, and he uh, assures me that he's walked that route many times. So aside from the policy aspect of it, I will just put to the committee, just think at the moment with the business interests and the support of the local community. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Uh, excellent. Do uh, we have any questions for the ward member from the committee? Councillor Perry. Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, Councillor Harris. Um, obviously, you've highlighted there's been a lot of support um, by by the, the locals and the and the parish council, etc. Um, there is no in in the committee report. There is nothing reflecting to people objecting, and I just wonder whether um, you know you're you're aware of any other you know people objecting who perhaps haven't haven't written through or is it you know you're indicating there is overwhelming support for this from the village um i just would be interested to have your views on that good evening councillor parry nice to hear from you and see you um no i've had no other objections it's overwhelming support on so many different levels for this thank you thank you uh, I've not got any further questions in the chat at the moment, so if that's the case, uh, Councillor Harris, thank you very much for your time this evening. OK. Um, Sorry, I meant to say thank you, Chair, but I didn't unmute. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. Lovely stuff. Right. OK, let's go to points of clarification. Uh, points of clarification from the committee. Let's start again. Do we have any questions from the committee for the officers? Uh, Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings here. I just wanted a bit more clarification on this large scale or small scale. And then there seems to be a sort of medium scale and it seems to be. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't understand. I'd like to be informed and clarified too, please. Thank you. We have part K of the council's adopted SPD, uh, which officers are affording uh, full weight. And that has a table on page three, which gives a number of factors you can take into account when considering if a development small scale, medium scale or large scale. So based on the circumstances of this particular case, um, officers consider there is a large scale site and we've assessed it on that basis. Does that answer your question? Sorry, and does that cover um, the caravans? Or is that specific? Is that mainly directed for housing? So this relates to holiday lets and caravan parks, Part K of the SPD, um, and we're looking at the number of units, whether or not it's seasonal use, what sort of facilities are provided, um, and we've assessed it as part. It, it's to assist officers in their planning judgment. So we've assessed it based on the information specific to this case, and we've used this as a guide to look at particular factors which may indicate if it's small, medium, or large scale. But there's, but there's no specific number, like a cut-off number. Numbers are a consideration, so the number of caravans, but we'd also be looking at the site, uh, the facilities, 
how how long it's open for, if it's seasonal or, or all year round use. So those are key considerations as well that we, we take into account when we're assessing any development. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richards, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Richards speaking. Um, I was going to ask a similar question that, uh, to Councillor Jennings over the interpretation of CS24, but you've answered that uh, nicely for me there. Uh, the other question I had was about the interpretation of the Neighbourhood Development Plan. We've heard from the Parish Council and they believe that policies HO1 and HO4 have been interpreted incorrectly. It does. I don't have the benefit of the full neighbourhood plan in front of me. I've, obviously, I've got your report, which does specifically say it's about housing development within the village. Um, is there anything else within the neighbourhood development plan, to your mind, that would that would otherwise support this type of development or a commercial venture in that location? Um, and is there any other way that could we one would otherwise um, interpret the two policies that have been referred to? So with regard to the neighbourhood development plan, we have assessed it as officers as part of our assessment. Um, the key policies that we've looked at are H1 and H4, where we're looking outside of the settlement boundaries, which is identified by the neighbourhood development plan. So we've looked at this development, we've, we're looking at it as a change of use of land for a caravan site for 12 months of the year, for occupation by people going on holiday and also contractors working in the area. So we've considered it on that basis. Um, there are no other policies having looked through the, the NDP to my mind that would be applicable to this type of development and um, so we have then assessed it against the core strategy policy CS24 um, and AS10 as it, the key principal policies for this development. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parry. Thank you Chairman, I was actually going to ask something very very similar which has been um, responded to by Erin um, and and if I can just go back to the SPD. Now, obviously it was adopted in July 2019, but I'm assuming that policy would have been written quite some time before July. It would have been written earlier in the year in view of all the consultation and the time it takes to um, become adopted. Would that be correct, Erin? So that's when it was adopted, yes. So it was July last year that the, the SPD was adopted. The policies were already in the core strategy. This was just to provide extra assistance to officers when carrying out their assessments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dixon. If you just want to unmute. Yes, that's go. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if planning permission uh, is granted this evening, uh, obviously the uh, papers before us indicate it's an application for 51 pitches split between touring caravans and tents, etc. Will the uh, conditions re en enable a restriction to those numbers? Because obviously Erin in her assessment says that apart from looking at the numbers, she was also looking at the facilities being provided, which to my mind was suggestive that she was afraid of a greater number of pitches subsequently happening because of the facilities. Um, personally, I'm looking at this one and thinking it's a medium size. Erin, uh, can you address that for us? In terms of the numbers, um, we are able to limit the number of pitches and the number of caravans. At this point in time, it's 51 pitches, which could be a combination of tents, touring caravans, trailer tents or motorhomes. Um, so it could be a variation of any of those with the one static mobile home that's proposed for permanent residential accommodation. Um, in the committee report, it goes into more detail about the assessment and it's the size of the site was also a consideration, the number of pitches, the occupation, the engineering works um, to accommodate the proposed use. So those are the key um, factors in this case that officers took into account. OK, uh, oh, here's Councillor Jennings. One more question. Councillor Jennings, so just a clarification, what have what have they got planning permission for at the moment? At the moment, it's understood that the site is operating with a certificate exemption for a five caravan site, which doesn't need planning permission. Um, the rest of the works are retrospective um, and do not benefit from the of planning permission at this moment in time. So we're considering it as a retrospective application to regularise and improve the facilities on the site. Thank you. Right. Um, oh, Councillor Parry. Apologies, Chairman. Um, Erin, the various pictures that you put up as part of your presentation showed um, 
really quite a quite a, a lot, you know, sort of it looked as though there was about 30, 20, 20 to 30 caravan touring caravans and motor homes. Um, if you're saying it's it's can you just explain why there would be so many pitched when you when when we're looking at this proposal this evening? Or are we or are is it in total retrospective? So the use of the land is currently being used um, for the siting of the mobile home, which was shown in the, the photographs in the presentation, and for the use of the land for touring caravans with an informal layout. Um, so it is retrospective in, in, in that respect, but the extra works, the engineering works, the, the new facilities that are proposed are also what we're considering as part of this application. So it's part to regularise and part to um, add in new facilities for customers. OK, and Councillor Adam. Thank you. Um, it was just in relation to the CS24 um, things that, that the applicant's uh, agent mentioned in relation to um, where they were outside of urban, uh, sorry, rural centres. Obviously, this isn't um, within the rural centre. I think the nearest one is about three and a half miles away being Southam. Um, but he men mentioned that there are seven points which I'm looking at, um, suggesting that it, it did meet those as a large uh, development. Um, can you just clarify why uh, you consider that it doesn't meet those seven criteria set out in our core strategy? Yes, in terms of CS24, it talks about large scale schemes for visitor attractions or overnight accommodation where wherever possible should be located uh, within the urban areas of Stratford or a main rural centre. It also goes into detail to say that large scale visitor, visitor accommodation may be justified in rural parts of the district where it's directly associated with is associated with an ancillary to a major existing tourist recreation conference or other form of business um, and it does have a number of points but that refers to that we'd look at in terms of it will need to be justified taking into account a number of criteria so we look at it as a whole um, but in this case officers don't consider it's fully justified in the rural location because we're looking at the development in the countryside and that's where officers have raised concerns with the principle of the development on that basis okay thank you okay I've not got any other questions, so should we move to the debate? Does anybody want to kick us off on the debate? Councillor Perry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we're living in a very sort of fast moving, changing scenario here, aren't we? Um, and, I, and obviously when the core, core strategy was developed, um, no one had any idea that 2020 would turn out to be the year it does. And I think um, one only has to look at what um, the way government has had to move in such a fast way to protect businesses. Um, and I've been trying to look at and assess this on the basis of, of the harm, its location. Um, certainly the location seems it's, there's, there's, there's no concern um, by residents. In fact, it's got the full support of the parish council. It's got full support from the residents, which is a pretty rare thing for a caravan site, to be honest with you. I don't think I've ever, I've been on this planning committee for about six years and I've never had a situation where we've got a caravan site with full support from the parish council and all the villagers and, and the residents. I do think, um, you know, I, I do think it's a way of inter interpretation um, and I'm inclined to go against the officer's recommendation and go and to support this because I'm interpreting CS24 as supporting um, tourism and I do believe there is a need um, because of obviously the public footway and also um, affordable accommodation as well. So having looked at this, heard all the various arguments, and I understand where the officers are coming from, from a pure policy perspective, but we're not operating in the real world at the moment. And I think we need to be doing everything we can to support rural businesses. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Um, Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I agree with uh, with uh, Councillor Parry. Uh, essentially, when I looked at this one and read the report, 
I thought the officer had come to, you know, a balanced judgment, but I thought it was a fairly finely balanced judgment. Essentially, one of the paragraphs in the report, the development is considered to introduce a number of benefits, including economic benefits to the settlement surrounding areas by supporting the local economy, environment benefits in the form of increased planting, increased choice of alternative modes of transport, improved access for visitors and residents of Harbury throughout the creation of a new footway, and they provide choice for tourist accommodation within the district. I personally would hate to think that a facility that is not linked or close to Stratford-upon-Avon or the other main rural centres had to be linked to a major tourist destination. I'm thinking of uh, Coton Court, etc. Would they really want a caravan site very close to them? I don't see the logic of trying to connect such uh, developments as this to local tourist attractions, and therefore I would be uh, in favour of granting this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards speaking. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, so I'm going to disagree with the previous two speakers um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try and explain why. If I first start, we, we, we clearly, yes, we do live in a different environment now from the environment we, we were in when the core strategy was written. But that change shouldn't render our core strategy and its policies redundant. They still apply and they still are our policies. Um, this very much hinges on the interpretation of those policies, as has been made clear by both the Parish Council and the, uh, the agent. Um, to my mind, addressing the, the Parish Councils first and the, their neighbourhood development plan, clearly we uh, can't really speak for the interpretation of that. The, the, the neighbourhood uh, development plan team wrote those policies, so they'll know how best to interpret those policies. Um, so I'm finding it difficult to argue against them on, on the one hand, but there is nothing specific within their NDP that would otherwise support this. So I, that one I think is finely balanced. But interpretation of our own policy, I do believe our case officer has done a very good job of putting together a report, explaining uh, the, the interpretation and how we, we should be interpreting it. Uh, we've seen that within our update sheet and again through the questions of clarity. Um, so to my mind, uh, the report is is correct, has interpreted things the way it should interpret. It then comes down, I guess, to a balance of harm versus economic benefit. And whilst, yes, there will be some economic benefit and yes, we want to be encouraging people to uh, grow their businesses and to develop um, uh, economically strong businesses within the district. We do have to weigh that against the policy that we have and we do have a very clear policy. To my mind, this has been interpreted correctly and I do believe we should be refusing in line with the officer's recommendation. In fact, I will propose that we do do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Um, we've got a pro proposal. Um, do we have a seconder at this point? I notice Councillor Adam would like to speak. Councillor Adam, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I was actually going to agree with um, Councillors Parry and Dixon uh, in um, supporting that this be granted. Um, I think reading Policy CS uh, 24, I can appreciate how fine the, uh, the balance is on this, and I think uh, the interpretation is a reasonable one to take. However, given the, the situation that the uh, applicant is clearly in the support from the local community and the doubt that was cast upon the assessment um, the, uh, of the you know, development plan as parish council. I think that, in my opinion, it would be um, not unreasonable to, to suggest that this would fall under CS24 uh, comfortably based on uh, the reading of the uh, criteria required. And I'd like to propose that we grant it uh, against the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Adam. Right, um, I've got Councillor Eden wanting to speak. So we've now got two propositions and I'll come back to them. I've got them in, I've got them all written down, but we'll come back to those in a second. Councillor Eden, would you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to go the opposite way uh, to Councillor Adam there and go with Councillor Richard's uh, opinion, I think. Um, I very much minded and appreciate Councillor 
Parry and Dixon and Adams. Um, viewpoint on the fact that the world is changing. We do definitely need to support businesses at the moment, but I keep coming back to the fact that the policies are there and they have been there and they should be adhered to because the world may well go back to what it was. Um, so I will second Councillor um, Richard's proposal to refuse. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think that's everyone. Um, right, we do have a prop, uh, proposition and a seconder. Uh, I, I think unless anybody else wants to speak, should we should we take the vote? The proposition which we've got to go with first uh, because it was the first one proposed and it was the first one seconded um, was to go with officers recommendations. It was proposed by Councillor Richards and seconded by Councillor Eden uh, to refuse this application. Um, I don't think there's anything else we need to go through before we go to a vote on this unless somebody's going to pick me up right and tell me I'm, I'm doing things out of order. So. Should we go through a, for a vote on this? Uh, Olivia, would you mind giving us the roll call, please? Yep, sure. Councillor Kendall. So the proposition obviously is to refuse. Uh, Councillor Kendall against. Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards for. Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam against. Councillor Dixon. Councillor Dixon, you're muted. Councillor Dixon, against. Councillor Eden. Councillor Eden, for. Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings, against. And Councillor Parry. Councillor Parry, against. Chair, that's five against and two for. Thank you. So the um, proposition falls. Uh, we have got a second proposition, uh, one for Grant. Before we go to that, um, I think I should go to officers and just double check because we do need to make sure that if we are going to go towards Grant, which I think we are, um, we need uh, possible conditions. So do we have a set of conditions that can be attached to this, please? Uh, Tracy or Erin, would you like to run us through any conditions that we should have attached in your opinion? Chairman, we do have some conditions um, which we could then look to get the details to be agreed with yourself and um, if members are minded to support the application. Um, so it'd be the standard conditions of uh, the time limit, the approved plans, the highways conditions that have been recommended by um, Warwickshire County Council, fire and rescue condition, network rail conditions and then when it comes to the caravans we'd be looking to limit it to those set out in the description so touring units only, um, that the touring units be removed when they're no longer required. Um, not for residential purposes for the touring units with only the one mobile home for residential full-time purposes um, and for holiday accommodation. Um, the number of pitches, the number of caravans and tents which shouldn't exceed 51 at any one point apart from the mobile home. So it'd be the mobile home and 51 touring units or, or tents. Um, the de in terms of the details of the enclosures around the mobile home, the number of months that the site can operate um, then we've got water butts for the building, bins for the mobile home, sewage treatment plant details, that the landscaping be retained for five years as proposed as part of the development, um, details of the facilities unit, electric vehicle charging points, hard standing, um, and then a number of notes as well, including the MPPF, landscaping highways and the footpath note. So those are the sort of conditions that officers would be looking to suggest if members are minded to support the application um, but it really comes down to making sure that we're tying the development in to what members are looking to support this evening. Thank you Erin. Uh, I think the, the conditions you say are, are, are rough conditions. I think they actually sound really detailed but I think we'll probably look to those to come back to a discussion for finalising with myself. I'm sure committee will be happy with that. Um, before we move on we do need, to, uh, I've got a, in the chat, could I uh, ask Tracy Humphreys just to follow on as well? Is anything to add there please? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, just to uh, back up what uh, Erin has said there, obviously there's quite a number of conditions there, some of which would be quite restrictive. Um, it would be our intention, I think, to negotiate those and include the applicant and their agent in those discussions uh, because clearly they would have a right of appeal against uh, some of those conditions. And I think we would want to explore with them uh, before we bring to you a set of conditions um, 
the extent to which they would uh, uh, be agreeing to abide by those. So if members do vote to uh, uh, approve the application, uh, we'd like to, I think, to have that negotiation with the applicant and then we can bring back their suggested conditions through yourself, uh, hopefully, and, and, and see what, uh, what range of mutually agreed conditions are possible. Or indeed, if there's a continued debate, we can bring that situation back to you as well. That's excellent. Thank you, Tracy. I think that would work well. Um, I, I'm reminded that we do need to explain during the meeting, of course, precisely what our reasons are for going against officers' recommendations. Um, Councillor Parry, you've indicated that you'd be happy to second the proposal to grant this. Um, would you be happy to go over the reasons that you're happy you would go against the officer's recommendation? I'm sure you uh, would. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, basically, I'm, I'm I would be very happy to second the proposals. I do feel under policy CS24, which is our tourism and leisure development um, section within the core strategy, is is that the, there is evidence there that they talk about the role of tourism being increased by supporting the growth and improvement of it of existing attractions well there's you know they're, they're they're currently using caravans there it is a tourist attraction just you know camping a caravan as far as i'm concerned i also think hs2 is going to get so much interest that people will want to come and have a look and see how the development's going um but it also says here large-scale schemes for visitors attractions or overnight um you know whilst i think that I do think there are a number of areas of, as I say, of CS24, which highlights the tourism and leisure development and camping and caravan is, 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 is a leisure activity. And I think that needs to be brought in as well. It's, we're not just talking about tourism here. Camping and caravanning is a leisure activity and there are sections I mean, without having to go through each one, I mean, the officers know it backwards, but there's there's loads of sections within CS24 that I feel that we could use to um, su support it. Thank you, Councillor Parry. So I think I think for the purposes of the meeting, we're, we're very much along the lines of uh, there's policy reasons that the yeah. benefits of this scheme vastly, vastly outweigh any any drawbacks, uh, I think. And I think that's 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 the mood of the meeting I'm taking. Um, so AS10, Chairman. Yes. AS, so I've got AS10, CS24, CS22. Yeah. I think the spirit of what we're trying to say lives in all of those, I think. Yeah. So I, I'm content that that's been aired properly in the meeting. Um, I'm Take, and I've just been to confirm, Councillor Parry, you're happy to second the proposition? Yeah, I'm happy to second Lewis. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Dixon, you asked to comment at this point. Would you like to come in very quickly? I did, uh, very quickly. Um, when it comes to EV points, can we have 10% of the uh, number of plots, i.e. if there's 51 plots, perhaps five EV charging points in the conditions? Well, maybe I'd go to either Tracy or Erin uh, to feedback on your thoughts regarding electric vehicle points. Would that be something we could maybe add as a note? Or yes, we could add it as a note um, if, as part of the, the proposal if members were minded to, to have 10%. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd prefer it to be added as a note, I think. And I wouldn't want it to be conditioned as part of this. Tracy, can, are you happy? Um, in fairness, Chairman, yeah, we can we can look at that. I think as part of the negotiations right. on the detailed conditions, we can look at what's appropriate for conditions and what would be appropriate as a note. And obviously, we can bring that and and agree that through you in due course. Okay, uh, Councillor Dixon's nodding, so I presume he's happy. Right. So I think we move to the vote on this one. So uh, we have. A proposition that has been proposed and seconded that we grant this application. Um, the conditions, of course, to be have been outlined tonight and will they'll be set, uh, firmed up in the next day or two with myself. Uh, we have also taken into account all of the updates on the update sheet tonight. I think we're ready to go to the vote, Olivia. Yeah, so Councillor Kendall. Councillor Kendall, four. Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards against. Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam four. Councillor Dixon. Councillor Dixon four. Councillor Eden. Yeah. 
Sorry, Councillor Eden against. Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings, four. And Councillor Parry. Councillor Parry, four. Chair, that's five, four and two against. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. So the committee therefore resolves to grant application reference 19 slash 02923 slash FUL. Right, and we can move to item five, our next application this evening. Um, I wonder who from Democratic Services, have we got the speakers? Are we ready to move to the next application? If I can just double check. Excuse me, Chairman, we usually, we agreed to have a five minute recess to allow oh. speakers to call in. OK, in that case, everybody, five minutes from now. Thank you very much. Adjourned for five minutes. If I could remind everyone to make sure. Ooh, make sure mics are muted, lovely, thanks.
OK, right. I'm informed that we've got all our speakers back in now, so I think we can continue the meeting. If everyone's OK. Excellent stuff. Right. Lovely. So um, the meeting's now live again. Wonderful. We continue to item five found on page 19 of your agendas. Uh, this is application reference 20 slash 00234 slash OUT. Uh, which is uh, land to the west of Western Road, Stratford Avon, and is for the erection of a care home for residents requiring nursing, dementia, and residential care with associated parking, bicycle stores, outdoor amenity space, and separate refuse and recycling facilities. The presenting officer is Alice Cosnett. Alice, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. So can you just confirm that you can see that, please? Perfect, yes. Lovely, and I'll just scroll through just to test that that's all working OK. Excellent. Perfect, thank you, Chairman. The application site, as identified by the black dot in the centre of the plan, is located in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon. The application site, as outlined in red, abuts the train station car park to its south, train line to its west, a gym and canal to its north, and industrial units to its east. The boundary of the canal quarter regeneration zone also lines the northern boundary of the site. This slide shows the relationship of the site to the train station, train line and industrial units and car showrooms on Western Road. The recently constructed development at Arden Quarter is located to the southeast of the site. The application before members this evening is an outline application for the erection of a care home with access and layout for determination under this application. Appearance, landscaping and scale would be reserved for later consideration. Members should note that the two site plans on screen are the same. In the right hand image, the plan has been zoomed in. The plan shows the access and layout proposed. Access would be gained at the northeast corner of the site. The layout of the site includes the building's footprint, general areas for outdoor amenity space and landscaping, as well as car and cycle parking. Although appearance and scale are reserved, the parameters provided at this stage are for a care home of up to 95 beds and up to four storeys in height. Policy CS26 identifies an area of the site as a future road link from Western Road to Birmingham Road and the layout plan incorporates in this location here undeveloped land where this link could be developed were it to come forward in the future. This photograph is taken from the train station car park to the south of the application site which is beyond the white fencing. The railway line is to the left of the photo out of view. This photograph is taken from Western Road looking toward the site, which is again beyond the white fencing. Again, from Western Road, here we are looking in a southerly direction with the application site beyond the fencing. The train station can just be seen in the distance and roof of Morrison Supermarket on the right hand side. This photo is taken around the corner of Western Road. The application site is the area of grassland in the distance. Chairman, this application is an outline with principal access and layout for consideration. The principle of development is acceptable, as is the impact on highway safety and amenity for future residents. Subject to a Section 106 agreement to secure financial contributions and biodiversity offsetting and conditions as detailed in the committee report, the recommendation is to grant this planning application. Thank you, Chairman. Perfect, thank you, Alice. Right, okie dokie. So our first speaker on this application is Councillor Ian Fradgley from Stratford on Avon Town Council. Uh, Councillor Fradgley, are you there, please? Councillor Fradgley? Is it star zero to unmute? Star six to unmute. Star six. Oh, yeah, got you now, Councillor Fradgley. Lovely stuff. Thank you. Can hear you very clearly. Thank, oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, as you know, it's okay. Um, you're there. You're doing it brilliantly, so we're okay. So, uh, as you know, you've got three minutes to speak. Please don't end the call at the end of your three minutes. We may have questions for you, um, and I'll give you a warning at thirty seconds. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay. okay. Over to you, sir. Thank you. The town council agree with both the county council and the Stratford doctors regarding Stratford 
approaching market saturation in care accommodation, particularly where the Stratford local health and social care infrastructure is already under extreme pressure. I understand that there is no local need, especially when the care home is aligned to the level of weekly fees charged in Barclay Care Home in Warwick, which implies that the prospective occupants will be coming from elsewhere in the country, making an even larger increase of pressure on our local doctors and health care. Local feelings were such that the Town Council hosted a meeting at the Town Hall and present were Town, District and County Councillors, the developer, two local doctors and uh, Warwickshire County Council representation. After a lengthy exchange of views, the final suggestion was that the developer would include an additional payment to the local health services to the level of one day service per week. The Town Council asked this application to be refused. However, if the committee is mindful to grant, then it should should do only so only do so when the day of the week funding to the local health service and doctors is part of the deal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Franchley. Excellent timing. Loads of uh, room there. Uh, do you have any questions uh, from the committee, please? If you could just indicate in the chat. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Richards here. Councillor Fred, you, you talked about um, the uh, the needs assessment and whether well, the fact that the current uh, needs or the current um, supply is under strain. We've had a um, an needs assessment that indicates that there is an unmet need. Could, have you got any evidence to support your assertion that it's currently under strain and therefore there is no uh, need? This information was coming from uh, Tim Willis at the County Council. OK. Um, and from the, and from the doctors themselves, of course. OK. Councillor, are you satisfied? I think, That's I an answer. <laughs> OK, uh, do we have any other questions from the committee? Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Fragley, um, I just wondered whether the Town Council had done any specific research with the care homes in the town centre itself to ascertain what the actual need is. Um, I mean, from personal experience, I know there's a desperate need for dementia care because not all care homes, they say they do provide dementia care, but in real terms, mm. they don't. I would just like to know what what research the town council did. The, the, the As I said to Councillor Richards, the, the information was coming from uh, the county council and the doctors themselves. They're, the doctors are the people under a, a great stress because um, we, we used to have four doctor surgeries in Stratford and one of them is closed. So the three doctor surgeries that are, are now left have to cater for the whole four that, that was there. Okay, I th thank you. Um, I think Councillor Parry, we're going we to have to leave it at that. I don't there's um, I think um, Councillor Fraggi has given the answer he can give at this point. Uh, are there any other questions to the Town Council, please? Um, just could give it a second in the chat, see if anything is loaded. OK, there isn't. In that case, Councillor Fraggi, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. I can go back to watching now. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, we go to our next speaker then, uh, which is the agent for the applicant, uh, Andrew Murphy, please. Mr Murphy, are you there? Mr Murphy's, there. Mr Murphy's there, Chairman, but he's still on mute. Is it star six, did you say? Yes, it is. Yeah. Star six, Mr. Murphy. So can you hear me now? Ah, got you. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Yes, that, I've, I've pressed <laughs> it twice. <laughs> Not at all. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Murphy. Well, Thank you. right. Uh, as before, you have three minutes. Uh, I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds. Um, please don't leave the line until we've had the opportunity to ask you any questions. OK, thank you. Over to you, sir. This is an empty derelict brownfield parcel of land in probably the most sustainable location in the whole district. It is not allocated in any local plan for any type of use. It lies outside the Canal Quarter regeneration zone 
and the landowner, Vintage Trains, has no intention of building a steam railway centre on the land, and previous planning applications for a steam railway centre expired long ago. It is not necessary to demonstrate a need for a care home, because a care home on this site is acceptable in principle. Nevertheless, a comprehensive assessment within a six mile catchment area has demonstrated an existing need for 165 beds, rising to 275 beds by 2031, and an over 65 population in the, in the town well above the national average, and is expected to grow further in the future. Further benefits to the local community involve visual enhancement of a derelict site, construction jobs, up to 100 full-time staffing jobs, increased expenditure in local shops and services, and £100,000 spent on biodiversity enhancement. The Town Council objects because they are concerned about a harmful impact on existing medical facilities in the town. However, no factual evidence has been presented to substantiate this claim. In contrast, there are several reasons why the proposed care home will not be a burden. Future residents of the care home are likely to derive from the local area with pre-existing health conditions and already registered with a local GP practice. Their health needs are not manufactured or exacerbated by the care home. Quite the opposite, nursing and dementia care will be provided within a specialist unit in the building. On-site support reduces the number of, trip, of trips to GPs, thereby reducing GP waiting lists. The care home can become a support service for local doctors and medical services, particularly in dealing with routine health matters. A room will be made available for a visiting practitioner to hold an in-house surgery. And there are social benefits from greater community interaction among the elderly, thus reducing loneliness. Ensuite shower rooms will make it easier to place residents in, in quarantine if necessary. And finally, the NHS South Warwickshire Foundation Trust and the NHS Clinical Commissioning Group are the key consultees on this matter. Each has lodged no objection, subject to financial contributions amounting to £60,000, to mitigate any impact on local healthcare infrastructure. I therefore commend this 95 bed care home to you as a, as a highly positive development for the town that complies with all relevant planning policies. Thank you. Mr Murphy, thank you very much. Excellently timed as well. Um, do we have any questions from the committee, please, for Mr Murphy, the agent for the applicant? Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings here. I'm sorry. Um, it blipped. My computer blipped just as you were getting onto the subject of £60,000. Um, I'm not sure if I was just as surprised to hear that, but uh, if you could just refresh me and just go over that line one more time, please. Yes, yeah, so there are two parts of the NHS. There's the NHS uh, Foundation Trust and the NHS Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, they've both, they're both in, you know, semi-independent and they have separately lodged no objections subject to sums of money. It's roughly £20,000 for one and about £40,000 for the other. So in other words, they all spend that money on, on local health facilities um, to be spent as they wish. Uh, that is their request. It's, it's what they want from the applicants and we are happy to deliver it through a Section 106 payment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, we move then to Councillor Adam for a question, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was just in relation to the um, needs assessment that was carried out. Um, now, I believe um, the, the representative stated 275 beds. Now, looking That's at right. what was in it, I see 26 um, being the unmet need at current, and then it goes on to say a more realistic realistic measure might be 165. Um, I don't I don't see where 275 is, is coming from. Right, so they've concluded that there's about 165 beds in need at the moment, uh, rising to 275 beds in the future. Um, so I'm just looking at the care, the needs assessment now. It's quite a lengthy document, um, but in one paragraph, I'm looking at paragraph 23.7 of their report, and they say predicted unmet need for the market standard bed spaces is by 2031 is going to be 275 spaces. So that, that's, that's the research that they've carried out. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm not picking up any more questions in the chat unless I'm going to give five seconds, four, three, two, one. In that case, there's no other questions. Uh, Mr Murphy, thank you very much for your time tonight. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, we should move to our ward member. Uh, we understand our ward member actually has declined to speak. He, he registered and deregistered himself, so he's not in tonight. Uh, so we can move to points of clarification. Does anybody have any points they'd like to clarify with the officers? I have one to start with before we go further. It, during the um, Power that sorry the town council's uh, statement, the uh, councillor Fragley mentioned something about day of the week funding. I'm a bit confused by the term. I've never heard it before. Can, could you give me a bit more information on that? Yes, of course, Chairman. So uh, I was actually at the meeting. It was the applicant was there um, as a stakeholder engagement with the town council, um, and he did offer this service. He he could contribute a financial contribution for a doctor uh, as an extra day service. That is a facility completely separate to, to the planning system, essentially. So it was a, a private offer. I don't know whether anything's come of it. Um, the cor correct procedure for us is to consult with the NHS South Warwickshire Foundation Trust and the NHS Clinical Commissioning Group. And they have simply requested those financial contributions which the applicant has agreed to pay. So there wouldn't be any additional contributions through the Section 106 agreement on the planning permission if forthcoming, which would require any sort of day service. Thank you. Uh, given I've been involved with an application a few years ago that was which was similar in, in, in a way where the uh, where the applicant and the company that they were representing offered uh, a number of other additional things that wouldn't usually fall into 106 agreements. And these were secured via an external additional agreement, legal agreement, which wasn't enforceable by the, uh, by the uh, council, by the district council. Given that we have no knowledge of this day service having been mentioned, we, we're not in a position to, met, to put that even in a note, are we, uh, as part of the conditions for this? No, we're not. Um, as I say, it, it wouldn't meet the necessary tests of, of 106 requirements. And similarly, there's been no formal offer yeah. in writing. It was sort of mentioned in a meeting. I, and I don't understand that there have been any further discussions, certainly not involving the council in respect of that matter. So I, I wouldn't suggest even putting a note on any forthcoming permission. That's no, OK. I just wanted to clear that up in my own mind before we yeah. went. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not picking up there are any other uh, points of clarification, so unless anyone shows up very quickly, I think we go to the debate. Is there anybody who'd like to start the debate? Ah, excellent. Councillor Parry, straight in there. Councillor Parry. <coughs> Sorry, Chairman. Um, well, actually, I can't see any material planning re reason to refuse this. Um, and also, um, whilst I understand the concerns that may have been raised by the GP practices, we've got no evidence of that. And actually, that is down to the um, clinical commissioning group to address um, capacity in GP surgeries. So I'd like to go straight to a proposal um, to support the officer's recommendation um, and grant for this application. Chairman, you're on mute. Oh, crikey. I know, sorry, apologies again. I know there are a number of people who want to speak on this, uh, and I'm guessing they'll be better at unmuting themselves. Uh, let's run through them. Uh, we go to Peter Richards next, please. Councillor Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Richards speaking. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Parry on, on, on her statements. Um, there's no clear evidence to support the assertions made by the Town Council uh, that would go against the needs assessment that we do have in front of the, uh, the evidence that we have in front of us from the needs assessment. Um, so on that basis, I'm entirely happy to second and move straight to a vote. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Uh, I'm going to give them opportunity to speak, so I'll run, but I'll take it as seconding that. So it's been proper proposed and seconded. Uh, Councillor Dixon, you're next. Thank you, Chairman. I was prepared to second, but uh, my question really is, as the eldest member here, by 2031, I'll be in my 80s. Should I be declaring an interest? 
I think we'll, we'll take that as read. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we go to Councillor Jennings. Councillor Richards beat me to it. Uh, I'd just I'd like to say I wholeheartedly agree with him and uh, no, I won't second it. It's already been seconded. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, there's nobody else indicating. Uh, I think we've got a proposal. We've got a seconder that we uh, grant this application. Olivia, would you like to go to the roll call for us? Yeah, Councillor Kendall. Councillor Kendall, four. Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards, four. Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam, four. Councillor Dixon. Councillor Dixon, four. Councillor Eden. Councillor Eden, four. Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings, four. And Councillor Parry. Councillor Parry, four. That's unanimous, Chair. Perfect, thank you very much. In that case, the committee resolves to grant application reference 20 slash 00234 slash OUT. Uh, we'll take another five minute brief adjournment while we prepare ourselves for item six. Five minutes, please. OK, I think we have the uh, speaker that we need in the meeting, so we're ready to go. Let's uh, reconvene the meeting, please, everybody. Before we reconvene, I just want to clarify. Uh, Tracy Humphreys has just reminded me I just need to clarify that the previous application was, of course, the committee resolved to grant that application to uh, 20 slash 00234 slash OUT, uh, subject to the 106 legal agreement as well. OK, so I've just confirmed that. <laughs> right, that being said, we can now move to uh, item six, which is found on page 41 of your agendas. 
Uh, this is application reference 20 slash 00556 slash vary. Uh, the site address is Highland Pool Head Lane, Tanworth in Arden, and is for the removal of reference to class E in condition number five of Planning Commission 19 slash 03444 slash FUL to allow owner to erect incidental outbuildings. Presenting officer is Tony Horton. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. I will just uh, share the presentation with members. Just bear with me. Hopefully you can see that. Perfect, I can see that. Right, thank you. OK, so the top slide is the committee uh, location plan. So it shows the site, which is the black dot in, in open countryside and part of the West Midlands Green Belt. And the land is due north of Tanworth in Arden. The site edge red taken from the committee papers as well. So Highland is a detached house within a large plot uh, set within ribbon development along Poorhead Lane. I'll move on to the elevations. The property was originally a small bungalow, but since around about the mid 1970s, it's had incremental extensions to it. And the officers have therefore in recent years resisted uh, vol further volume increases. However, uh, permission was granted for a first floor extension um, under application 19 slash 03444FUL. And that permission required the demolition of the garage to the side and the sitting room behind that as part of the compensation for the increase in volume. So the elevations that you can see there on the left hand side is the existing front elevation as the property currently stands. To the right of that, uh, the yellow area is comparative of the existing front elevation and then above there is the permitted uh, the the first floor extension that's been granted under the previous planning permission. And there on the bottom are the elevations, which shows the garage element with the sitting room behind having been removed and the gap to the side. We'll move on to the floor plans. First of all, the first floor. So on the left hand side there, we have the existing properties. So there are the three bedrooms and the uh, two bathrooms and then a void space above the, the garage area. And on the right hand side, we have the, the permitted um, permission. So it's got these two additional bedrooms with ensuite. That will make that a five bedroom property. And it's showing the elements here, which is the garage with the sitting room behind uh, as being demolished. And then onto the ground floor plans. So the existing on the left, you can see we have the garage with the sitting room behind and then if you swing over to the right see that the garage and part of that sitting room are demolished uh, to compensate for the volume of the first floor extension and in the process the applicants are going to reconfigure the rear of the ground floor to provide the kitchen dining room and, and family room at the back there the area here will have uh, gated access and be hard standing and then i've got a photograph of the front elevation. So the garage element here uh, is to be uh, taken away. First floor extension on there and there are planning conditions to require the demolition of the garage and also planning condition to re remove permitted development rights, which include uh, the rights to extend the property and also the rights to have outbuildings and other developments within the curtilage. And it is that element, um, class E, outbuildings and development within the curtilage, which the applicants are seeking to retain and which officers consider should be still uh, deleted. Uh, so still um, the permitted rights not given. Uh, Chairman, uh, there's one update letter from a neighbour, uh, which is reported in the update report, and the recommendation is to refuse uh, the vari variation of the wording of condition five of the extant planning permission. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much, Tony. Um, before we go to our first speaker, I should just note uh, for people watching that Councillor Dixon 
has uh, stepped off the committee for this application as stated at the beginning of the meeting uh, because of course this is in his ward and he has uh, it will be speaking as the ward member just to confirm that for everybody right thank you very much tony for an excellent presentation we go to our first speaker miranda rogers please who is the agent for the applicant are you there miranda can you hear me now oh perfect lovely first one that's coming first time excellent stuff <laughs> i you. understand what the first speaker meant about the time delay because obviously <laughs> i can see what happened and I can't hear you at the same time I'm trying to speak to you. It's very confusing. But anyway, we are where we are. We will work on it. Don't worry, we're taking you <laughs> on So uh, as you've been here before, you know the routine. So you have three minutes. Uh, please don't end the call at the end of the three minutes. We may have some questions for you. And of course, I'll, we'll give you a warning at 30 seconds. OK, thank so, you. Over to you. This application is solely about planning conditions and more particularly about a planning condition which will prevent a property owner from being able to erect buildings incidental to the use of his house under permitted development rights, the so-called Class E. The National Planning Policy Framework states that planning conditions should only be attached to a permission if they meet six tests. They must be necessary, relevant to planning, relevant to the development to be permitted, enforceable, precise and reasonable in all other respects. National Guidance Online notes that conditions which restrict the future use of permitted development rights may not pass the tests of reasonableness or necessity. Highlands, as you have heard, is a detached property with a large garden. The property currently benefits from all its permitted development rights and as such could erect buildings incidental to the enjoyment of the house under Class E without recourse to the council, things like greenhouses, summer houses and sheds. The officer's report regarding the approved scheme noted that Highlands started out as a modest bungalow and that as a result of the size increase over the years and given its greenbelt setting, it is considered appropriate to remove permitted development rights to prevent any further enlargement. I don't disagree with this. The house has already been extended considerably and further extensions would be contrary to your development plan. But your officer made no reference to the erection of incidental outbuildings in the determination of the application because such a consideration had no bearing on whether the proposed alterations to the dwelling were acceptable or policy compliant. Yet the right to erect such buildings under Class E were removed without justification. The removal is unnecessary and unreasonable and the condition therefore fails two of the national tests. The council now says that the removal of the permitted development right is to prevent the erection of a garage adjacent to the house, but it does so much more. It removes the right to erect any outbuilding, no matter how small, and that is what is so unreasonable. If the government intended to prevent the erection of incidental outbuildings for houses in the Greenbelt, there would be a blanket removal, but there is not. So when determining this application, I ask you to consider whether the removal of the right to erect an incidental outbuilding is reasonable or necessary to ensure the proposal for the house extension complies with the development plan. I would suggest that it is not, and therefore that the application should be approved. And just a final thought. If the application is approved, it is likely that the owner will erect a garage to the side of the altered house under his permitted development rights. Just... However, however, if the application is refused, the owners will still be able to erect a garage until the extension's permission is, is implemented. The garage would have to be set behind the existing house, but when the house works are complete, it would be visible from the street and would be far more intrusive to the adjacent neighbours at Meadow View. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, with five seconds to spare. Excellent. So, do the committee have any questions, please, for the uh, applicant's agent? Just pause for a second, see who there's anything. OK, I'm getting no questions here. So in which case, uh, Randall Rogers, thank you very much for your time tonight. It's been greatly appreciated. Thank you. OK, um, we'll move to our next speaker, who is our ward member, Councillor Dixon. Councillor Dixon, you have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, over. Chairman. Um, before I start, can I just check with Tony that he has my uh, photographs ready for a run through? Essentially, Tony, after my first opening paragraphs, um, I shall run through them as a single sequence, but the prompt is the word next, and I would ask that you move on at that time. Once the 
photographs start appearing, please don't come back to me as the uh, as the image. Thank you, Chairman. I'll start, now start. Over to you. Thank you. This assessment is to be made. The, uh, the assessment to be made when considering extensions to properties in the green belt is does it harm the openness of the green belt? Officers often use volume calculations to aid their assessments, but decisions are not number driven. For example, a decision last week included this phrase. When taking into account the visual impact of the dwelling's presence, the cumulative impact of this proposal is unlikely to detrimentally impact upon the openness of the green belt to a harmful extent. The increase over the original building is calculated at 92%, an increase from the current 77%, and only DP rights A and B were withdrawn. That is an application around the corner from Highland. I now ask Tony to show the series of photographs. Thank you, Tony, for putting that first one up. The first one, the current property, you can probably assess where the original bungalow was prior to the first floor gable fronted extension, which was granted permission in 1992. Next, please, Tony. A picture of, the, of a refused application two years ago. The volume calculation was 111% against the current 55% increase from the 1992 conversion. Next, please, Tony. This is the application withdrawn last year when the planners were about to recommend refusal again because the volume was still 88%. You can see the dotted line depicting the current outline of the property. There was no increase in the footprint, just the extra volume of the roof. I would have supported this application had it come to committee, and interestingly, the parish council did not object. Next, please, Tony. The area where a tandem garage will be built if tonight's application is refused and PD rights are not reinstated. Next, please. The next are two pictures of typical outbuildings which in future would need planning consent to be replicated and could therefore be judged as inappropriate if you do not support this application to reinstate PD rights. The next, please. That's another typical shared outbuilding. And the next, please, Tony. A new house built across the road from where the garage has been relocated and an infill site created. Please remember this picture. Next, please. This shows where that garage was relocated to, the other side into the front garden on the other side of the large plot. Next, please, Tony. Uh, now, another example. This one is two plots away from Highland. Again, you can see an extensive extension to the side. Next, please, Tony. This is a new application granted only last week. Policy hasn't changed very much. This shows the property as it is now. And the next and last picture shows the approved extension. But this house is not in the local service village, which Highlands is but in the open countryside. All these examples have been assessed to have acceptable impact upon the openness of the Greenbelt. The officers feel that a double garage at the side of Highland would, however, be detrimental and harm the openness of the Greenbelt. I am of the opposite persuasion. Tonight, you have heard what will happen if you support the officer's recommendation and do not reinstate the PD rights. A new double length tandem garage behind the existing garage, destroying greenery and laying more down, down more hard surface. I have shown local examples where the impact on the openness was considered acceptable, and I have pointed out that it is not a matter of calculation of volume, but of impact. You now need to decide which is the fairest, most practical and the least damaging option. A double garage to the side, which is supported by the neighbours, or a tandem garage at the rear, laying down more tarmac. 30 seconds. The new SPD on climate change is coming to the council next week. By the way, the couple who built the new house where the garage was relocated to the front garden on the other side, 
are the same couple who converted Highland from a bungalow in 1992 into the house you see today. Some people are lucky, others just come up against guidelines. You have the opportunity tonight to grant fairness and a practical solution. I ask you to vote in favour of the application. Right, Thank, you. Thank you, Chairman. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. Councillor. Right. Do we have any questions for the ward member, please? I'll take that as a no, in which case, Councillor Dixon, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'll move myself. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, points of clarification for the officers. Do we have any points of clarification? Give it a moment. Thank you, Councillor Adam. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Tony, it, it was just uh, in relation to the the way in which the 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 full application was conditioned. Um, now, obviously, the p permitted development rights is, is a mechanism to to achieve um, what officers saw as a, a suitable way to restrict overdevelopment. Um, are there other mechanisms that might be able to do that without um, uh, restricting these rights that, that are clearly contentious enough to, to have this variation application come in? Um, I can't think of any other way that officers could control uh, development other than by legal agreements, which seems a bit heavy handed in this case. Um, the removal of the permitted de development rights is to ensure that the openness of the green belt is maintained and to prevent the urban sprawl. Uh, and that would be done by uh, requiring further planning permission for extensions and outbuildings. That's not to say the local planning authority wouldn't necessarily grant those, but it would need to have the control over that so it could assess the, the case and the impact on the green belt. So effectively what you're saying, Tony, sorry to jump in. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think Councillor Adam, it's a good question. And what the other mechanisms would be either what's being suggested tonight or a, a, a new planning application uh, to reflect what's, what's effectively being asked, which is to retain a garage. Am I, am I right in understanding that? Uh, yes, the, the applicants could make another application to with the scheme which included the garage and retained it in that form. They could uh, also apply to vary the condition on the original permission, which requires the demolition of the garage. So they, think they could apply to have that condition removed or they could appeal against the conditions or appeal against any decision if we uh, refuse the application tonight. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you for going over that. Um, are there any other points of clarification before we move to a debate? No, in that case, the debate. Does anybody want to start? Kick us up on this. Councillor Richards, perfect timing. Thank you, Councillor Kendall. Uh, Councillor Richards speaking. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit concerned that the uh, presentations that we've had um, appear to re be reopening or seeking to reopen the debate over the original application. We're not looking to decide on the location or design or size of a garage. We're being asked to look at a condition that has been put on. It has been made abundantly clear within the officer's report and by our officer that without the removal of the existing garage, sorry, without the removal of the permitting development rights of, of Class E, then the application, the previous application wouldn't have been granted. Um, I don't think it's right that we should be threatened with the potential for a garage being located elsewhere. We're not here to determine that, that if, if, if the applicant were minded to build uh, such a garage, then that would have to be compliant with planning law and it is down to our officers and to our enforcement team to determine if it is lawful for them to do that. They will do that in time. We need to decide on whether it is appropriate and right that this condition was put on. And as I say, it's been made very clear within the officer's report and again verbally by the officer that it is. So with that, I will propose that we go with the officer's recommendation and refuse the applicant uh, application. Councillor Richards, I couldn't have said it better. It was absolutely what I'm thinking. There's really no reason for us to go against officer recommendation. Uh, I, I'm happy to second it, but um, let's go through the speakers who wish to come in. Uh, Councillor Adam first, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I was going to sort of reiterate that. I think the, the question that I asked for clarification um, essentially answered that 
there isn't a mechanism to to ensure that there is no removing the say, further development of the site couldn't be achieved through further permissions. Um, I, I think it's um, difficult given the the neighbouring properties and the and the development in that area. Otherwise, but I think. Councillor yeah, Adam, you're frozen. In terms of how we um, operate as as a planning or. Setting a precedent for, for the control mechanisms that are required. Thank you, Councillor Adam. OK, um, we go to, we go to Councillor Parry now. How's that? Oh, hold on. We're, no, we're, no, on. Councillor Adam, are you, are you, sorry, you, you, we're, we're struggling with your um, connection. Have you finished? Have you finished your, your point? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Just uh, I think the points I was going to make have, have been made anyway. Thank you, Councillor Adam. We'll move to Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, excellently put, Councillor Richards. And I would actually, you know, at the end of the day, conditions are set on planning, um, the granting of planning permissions. The, the conditions are set there for a very good reason. And at the end of the day, if, if the applicant wants to put a, a, a garage somewhere or a summer house, they just go through the process of a planning permission. We're not here saying tonight that they can't have them where they want them, um, but we're talking about a process and a precedent here. Um, and so I will be going with the officer's recommendation. OK, right. Well, I'm not getting anybody else indicating they want to speak. Councillor Richards proposed uh, that we follow the officer's recommendation to refuse. I'm happy to second that. Um, I think the only thing we have to do is go to a roll call for the vote, if everyone's happy with that. Olivia, should we start? Yep. Councillor Kendall. Councillor Kendall, four. Councillor Richards. Councillor Richards, four. Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam, four. Councillor Eden. Councillor Eden, four. Councillor Jennings. Councillor Jennings, four. And Councillor Parry. Councillor Parry, four. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you. Therefore, the committee resolves to refuse uh, application reference 20 slash 00556 slash vary. Um, that's our last item, our last application for the evening. Olivia, do we have any urgent business? I don't think we do. We don't, no. Well, uh, in that case, I think that brings us to the end of this evening's meeting. Thank you very much to officers, members of the committee, applicants, all speakers. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. We can close the meeting. <laughs>